This video was originally recorded February 2019 during the ongoing Force for Good class series. To learn more about this ongoing series, please visit TibetHouse.us. Hi, everybody. Nice to see everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming. This is uh, the third lecture of uh, the uh, Force for Good, Dalai Lama's Force for Good. And it's also my third lecture here. And I think a number of you were here at, at the first two, um, which is great. In this, in this lecture, um, I wrote, we'll examine the likelihood of, well, it's called Singularity and Simulation, Backdoor to Enlightenment. We'll examine the likelihood of superintelligent artificial intelligences, human, silicon, or hybrid. We'll create a universe or two. Well, maybe I overstated that a little. Um, maybe only one. Um, and become immortal. Uh, okay. Um, we'll think about what that could mean for us and for others. Um, and if there's time, I'd like to talk some more about consciousness, reincarnation, uh, faith, and uh, a little bit of quantum mechanics. And uh, uh, so thanks to Tibet House again. And uh, let's start, since this is a Buddhist teaching, by simply taking refuge. I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. That's only if you want. It's nice to have a place to take refuge, especially when it's so cold. Um, so. Before uh, taking on the singularity and simulation, um, let's see where we've been. Now, first of all, who, for, how many of you are here for the first time in this series? Okay, a bunch, so I'll do a little recap. Um, and uh, what we did was both times we started with uh, Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which, uh, in which that great educator and... Uh, uh, an activist uh, from Brazil uh, critiqued what he called the banking method of education where the teacher teaches, the teacher is active, the students are passive, and the teacher just deposits stuff into the minds of the students. It's, it's, uh, it, it sounds terrible, doesn't it? Oh, I can't put my jacket off because I have the... <laughs> ah, okay. Um, and and so, in, so in that spirit, you know, I'd like to have this be as much of a conversation as possible. So if anybody has any, uh, anything they'd like to say, question, point to be made, that's great. Just let me know and we'll do it that way. Um, so, uh, and, and so what I'd like us to do just for, just for a minute is to just turn to the people around you and just introduce yourself. I think I met most of you who do that. I could just, I could just leave now, <laughs> and it would have been a success. Um, okay, so um, in the first, really in the first two, but especially in the first lecture, talked about uh, getting lost, really a process of disorientation, and, and the reason for that was because I think only if you get lost do you have a chance of getting found, and then only if you get lost and you change your perspective, can you have a chance to see what I've been calling, uh, after David Foster Wallace's famous speech at Kenyon, the water in which each of us swims. From the, the little story about the two fish swimming along and one fish says the other fish, how's the water? And the other fish says, what water? Right, because most of the time we're swimming in the water, we're on automatic pilot and we don't really know uh, what's going on. So the disorientation is to get out of that. And then, then we used the method of a flashlight. The analogy of a flashlight is if we're holding a flashlight and 
looking at things, and we looked at all kinds of things like the edge of tables and chairs. From the perspective of the holder of the flashlight, we're looking at that corner, and then switch perspective to the flashlight itself. And then back. And at least with me, and with some of you, I think, what happens is when you switch the perspective of the flashlight, that three-dimensional perspective that we had being the holder of the flashlight goes to almost a flat two-dimensional perspective because we're just the flashlight. And then you can ask yourself, well, what was there before that is no longer there? And, and this uh, actually is a kind of, of emptiness. It's the perspective of the flashlight is empty of the perspective that includes you holding the flashlight. Right, and so in a way, what this does is it, it, it opens up a kind of dialogue with very familiar objects and people, and and may work on egotism a little bit just to start, and and in a way it diminishes this solidity of objects. We're starting to play with them as we shift our perspective, um, and and so once we shift out of the perspective of the holder of the flashlight which basically is our ordinary perspective. We walk around, oh, I think I'll look at Layla now, right? Shift, done. And once we get out of that, then uh, we, we, we see things differently and we're aware of when we're back on our ordinary perspective, how we're doing it. We can see it for the first time. It lets us see the water we're swimming in. And, uh, and, and then, we talked, of course, about what we call in Buddhism, wisdom and compassion inseparable. In a way, when we're doing this with the flashlight, that's a little experiment with wisdom, seeing things the way they really are. And what the Buddhists say is, if you could really see things the way they are, you'd see that things all inter-exist. We inter-are with each other. Nothing is so separate as we think, because we generally think of ourselves as, you know, Hannah with a capital H, although Hannah is very modest, she probably doesn't. But if she were not so modest, it would be Hannah, right? And so it allows us to see, if we really look at it, that we're empty of those exaggerated qualities. And, 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 and in fact, most of us, I think, and maybe I'm projecting here, suffer from the disease of reification, meaning we make things and people into things. Reification, uh, what uh, my little sister used to call being a biggie. Uh, and, and so the best medicine for this exaggerated sense that we have, e either and it doesn't have to be arrogant, it can be defensive also, right? This exaggerated sense we have that separates us, the best medicine is what the Heart Sutra says, taking it literally. We don't exist. We don't exist. The Heart Sutra says no Four Noble Truths, no eye, no ear, no nose. And, and one really good medicine for that is saying we don't exist, and then we went over the Buddhist uh, belief and philosophy that, that really it's only a Buddha, someone who can really see reality, who can see that things exist at the same time seeing that they don't really exist at all. Can do both of those at the same time. So we played a little bit with that. Then we started talking about you know, reincarnation, trying to cover everything. And, uh, and how can, if, if in Buddhist doctrine, people don't exist, Right? There is no self, meaning no exaggerated self. Right? What is reincarnated? It's a really tough question, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. We got into it. And then I told some stories about paranormal events that I had witnessed, just to further disorient everyone. Um, and, and the purpose of disorientation also is, as you get more and more lost and distant from your usual way of automatic pilot, if you look at it as a positive thing and don't let it freak you out and really go into it and go with it, 
uh, you might be able to feel a spaciousness and a kind of an opening in your heart and mind as you're lost, as you keep asking questions. It's a way of purifying one's mind, not holding on to things. And in that way, you become open. You become more and more open. It would be a very beautiful thing. But that's, so that's the kind of pedestrian stuff that we started with. But now, in this talk, um, I'd like to leave that ordinary stuff behind and, and, and go a little cosmic, if that's okay with you. So, um, in the, as, as uh, many of you know, in the courses that at least I teach in the religion department, um, we take a lot of our time talking about computer superintelligence, computer simulations, quantum mechanics. Uh, sometimes not very comfortable for me because these are deep and subtle fields uh, out of my real training, but fools rush in. So, so here I am. Uh, because I think maybe there, are two real, there are two main reasons for discussing technology in the religion department. It's nuts, right? Okay. Uh, the first reason is that talking about technology these days is a great way to learn about religion and learn about, uh, learn about everything. Hello, Kaya. And, and the second reason is technology is changing everything. And uh, you all know this already and we'll get into a little bit more. So let's start with the first reason, how technology can uh, teach us a lot about spirituality in religion. And some of you have heard this, and I apologize in advance. Ray Kurzweil is the chief engineer of Google. And uh, he's a very smart dude. And he predicts that by 2045, we will enter into what he calls the singularity. And the way he describes it is that there's been a long evolution of intelligence uh, in human history, going up and up and up a little bit at a time. And then it starts to increase a little more, and then we start designing computers, and now we're dealing with artificial intelligence and general artificial intelligence, and computers are getting smarter and smarter. Uh, and what will happen when computers start to, to design themselves? Well, this intelligence curve will shoot up and become, uh, in a little while, infinite. And at that point, our, our intelligence will permeate the universe, but on the way to doing it, we will be able to live for as long as we want, manifest in virtual or other kind of reality as whoever or whoever's we want. Anybody see the movie Her? Right? She says, I'm having relationships with 642 people right now. <laughs> That's kind of a blow to him. So, uh, but we'll be able to do that. And, 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 and it sounds, this sounds, and this is from chief engineer of Google. This sounds an awful lot like religion. Yes? It does. Okay. So, and he wasn't the first one to say this. There have been other, the others who call themselves transhumanists because we're now transcending uh, the human. And now there's a transhumanist religion and, uh, and there's a singularity university, actually, which is out in, uh, you know where, California. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now some folks disagree with Kurzweil, they say he's being too optimistic or he's just wrong. There's a famous article by Bill Joy of Sun Microsystems years and years ago called Why the Future Doesn't Need Us, which pointed out the dangers and shortcomings of all this. But, but Kurzweil is chief engineer of Google and he believes this. So let's just go with it. He might be right. Um, yeah, done. Oh, Hitch Hitchhiker's Guide, yeah. Yeah, I was listening to that the other day. Computers create computers. Right, right. This is permeated. This, in, in other words, oftentimes science fiction is there first. But this, has been, this notion has been around, and now 
it has really been adopted by some people. And now, as we really advance toward artificial general intelligence, and things are really starting to happen. They're happening to the extent that people like Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, and, and a bunch of others say, wait a minute, we better really watch this because we could be going the way of the Neanderthals uh, very quickly because once we have this super intelligence, it doesn't have to pay much attention to us. What if we're just a source of carbon uh, for some project that they're working on? So this is, this is a very important issue. We'll get to that a little bit later. So question, if we're approaching this and we'll have the, the ability and we see it already with virtual reality and augmented reality to create whatever kind of world we want to create, the question is, uh, what kind of world would you create? Would you uh, choose to be smarter? Show of hands. If you could. Choose to be smarter, uh, better looking. Nobody wants to go there. Okay, <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, what about what about immortal? Show of hands. How many would choose to be immortal? Let's hear. How many would choose to not be immortal? Everybody wants to die. Okay. So, so okay. <laughs> and, and, it's, it's, and 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 think. Keep keep that. Keep that thought. In in. The first time that I posed this question, uh, Steve, who was a uh, general studies student at Columbia, uh, who he ran a Verizon store in Queens in his day job, and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, in order to have a sunny day, don't you have to have some rain sometime? So then the question became, how much rain? Would you have mosquitoes? No mosquitoes. Even the Dalai Lama says no mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, uh, and and you know, would you have the common cold? Now look, we could be getting to the point where we can actually do this. We can do a lot with virtual reality already. But just imagine that we get to this point. And what about, what about death? Do you need death to appreciate life? Tim? So your question was, how many of us would like to be immortal? Mm -hmm. um, and my response is, in what form? Oh, whatever form you want. I mean, like, do I have to keep doing this forever? No, or no, you don't. Have, no, no, no. You could, you know, pick your, pick your rock star. Pick <laughs> your, you know, whoever, whoever you want. Yeah. yeah. Forever doesn't seem very interesting, but something else could be. Oh, yeah, you could, you, yeah, you could be a lot of people. You could have relationships with yourself, you know, to whatever you want to do. So, so okay, so, but, but this question, what kind of world would you create, raises the whole question of what we call in, in theology, theodicy. Why are there bad things in the world, right? If you could create, Jamie, your own kind of world, are you going to put any bad things in it? And why? Right, so, so this is a question that's been debated in, in, in churches, mosques, temples, you know, uh, forever. And yet, so, but when we think about Kurzweil, we go there. And, and the, the, the amazing thing is that when you think about it this way, you don't think about it from the same vantage point with all the baggage that you usually have. In other words, if you're... You know, if you're brought up in a religious tradition, then the first thing when you hear a question like this, why are there bad things in the world, you, you come up with all the stock answers. God is testing, God does this, it's not what it seems to be, and, and there's all that baggage. Here, you think about Kurzweil and the singularity and creating a world, bam, you get right there, right, from the back door. So you don't have all your family issues, Right, they don't call it the nuclear family for nothing. Um, and so, so here's, here's another one for you. Um, if you could take the pill, and, and, and Tim answered this, but if you could take the pill right now, I have in my hand, you know, however many of you there are, you know, um, take a pill and become immortal and healthy, right? Would you do it? Say I have the pill. 
Okay, how many of you would take it? It's your one chance and you have 10 seconds to decide to take it. One, two, you have to raise your hands high, you won't get it. Three, <laughs> four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, it looks like about a quarter to a third of you. That's interesting. Um, now, when you're thinking about those of you who chose not to take the pill, why not? Let's hear some reasons. Why not? Because yeah, Kaya. Well, when the earth like, implodes into a giant ball of fire, do I just like, float through the void forever? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you were, you, 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 yeah, okay. End of the heat death of the universe, what's going to happen, all that stuff. Any, any other reasons for not taking the pill that you have? Who? Yes? Mm -hmm. Knowing that it's not going to be forever so that I appreciate every moment. And I feel like knowing if it was going on, I wouldn't be able to put in the practices to be my best self with every gives, gives life meaning and gives you incentive. Right. Right. And you're thinking in terms of what you can do to become enlightened. Right. Anybody else? What reasons not to do it? Yeah? Sure. Well, we already exist in eternity, right? So, uh, it exists in eternity. We do exist inside eternity. We are children of eternity. So, I, I so maybe it doesn't matter then. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's I would, I would call that the advanced view. <laughs> so, but now when I think about why I oh another one. You still suffer, right? I think of it uh, maybe in more, you know, more in, in really kind of common terms. Like, what if then everybody I know might die? Like, what if I'd be lonesome? What if I'd be bored? Right. So, um, but in a way, this question about taking the pill, which became famous in the Matrix, um, it's kind of a diagnostic test, right? If you think. And if you think about yourself, like, you know, I tend to do, right? Am I going to be lonely, et cetera, et cetera? Um, then you come out, I might choose mortality, right? But what if I were thinking just in terms of, of helping others? What kind of a doctor, Hannah, could I be if I lived for hundreds of years training, 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 Think of all the people I could help. So, so, in, so well here also, thinking about this technology gives us, gives us a way to look into it. And, and, and this is even if Kurzweil's wrong, it doesn't matter. It just gives us a whole other way to look in it. The, it. Look at it, we never had before, particularly because in our culture, we tend to be very materialist. Not materialistic, well, we tend to be that too. But materialist in terms of thinking that everything is just physical. Right? So it's very hard for us to engage in real theological and philosophical questions when we think, well, it's all a question of brain and body and I'll die and that's it. Here, when we think about could there be a technological solution to mortality, right? it gives us a way, us in our culture, a way to think about these things that we didn't have before. So that's even if Kurzweil is wrong, um, but what if he's right? Then, new ball game, we could be the last of this kind of species of humanity. Gary? Isn't the only way we're going to truly be able to help people is to become food or to become life? So that's going to take many life times. The same way the historical Buddha lived many lifetimes and was a bodhisattva and had many great lifetimes. I mean, not being a great doctor in the end it really takes a Buddha to truly help you. Well, I would say this be a Buddha, that's great. Then you're kind of a superhero in terms of helping people. But you don't have to be a Buddha to help people. In fact, if just a very good doctor, you think of the suffering that you could alleviate, even if you don't get to Buddhahood. And also thinking about, I mean, the way we're doing it now, even if 
even if we live in eternity, even if you believe we're being reincarnated, oh my goodness, I was reincarnated again, I got to learn it again, I forgot all that stuff, I got to have dreams and then go, you know, find this one and that one. It's a very inefficient process. And just imagine if you could take the pill and then just keep working on becoming Buddha, right? And because that's the quick path, that's the tantric path, that's the tantric technological path. So, so there could be, so there could be advantages to that, you know, uh, I think. Uh, but then, the question is, if you're rich enough, um, because, you know, as usual in our society, there are vast class differentials. Some people have money, some don't. The rich tend to do well and do what they want, and in this case, they'll be the first ones to take the immortality pill. And when they asked the Dalai Lama a similar thing about life extension, Dalai Lama's reaction, I saw this, he was asked about this very recently. He said, P young people come and old people go. But there are 10 p billion people on earth, or soon to be. We have global warming, water shortages. In nature, whole galaxies come and whole galaxies go. Um, so he thought that the most important thing is that while we're alive, we'd be more compassionate. And then he made a joke. He said there should be more monks and nuns to control the population. <laughs> <laughs> he laughed about that. So, so here's, here's, another, here's another question. If you could take a pill, guaranteeing, it's a big pill thing tonight, um, guaranteeing you would be reincarnated 10 times, would you do it? Show of hands. you do it? Anybody else? Well, just 10 times versus, you know, not being reincarnated, say. Okay? Right. Right. Do it. Do it 10 times. Okay. What about uh, 1,000 times? Who would do it 1,000 times? Anybody would do it 10 times but not 1,000 times? Why? Sounds like too many. Sounds like too many. <laughs> <laughs> but I, agree, I agree with you. So what about, what about endlessly? Who would, choose to, uh, who would choose to reincarnate endlessly? Endlessly. Sarah, endless? Endless? Yeah. yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Okay. So, so, so that's cool because that, um, this brings up a lot, this question. Um, if you're given a choice about reincarnation, what, as you point out, Bradley, what are we assuming is the, the opposite, right? Is it oblivion, right? Why do we assume that there is such a thing as nothing. Has anyone here ever seen nothing? Where is it? By definition, it's not there. Right, seriously. So, so uh, but, and yet we think so. And this, is, this could be why that in cultures who do have a belief in reincarnation, what they seek is release. Moksha, release. We tend in in our culture to say, well, I can be like, you know, 28 and, you know, life is good. Why wouldn't I want to do this again and again and again and again? So we like it and we think, well, it'd be great. Maybe there's heaven. I could just be this like way forever. But in, but in cultures where they do believe this, uh, they want out because they don't want to come back and back and back because they realize also that coming back could be much worse than it is now in all the various life forms they could be. So, but, but then, I think Sarah's spirit uh, gets to this, um, it also gets to your general attitude about life, right? Would you choose to be reincarnated? It gets to your attitude of, are you like this, right? Or like this, <laughs> or like that, eh? like that, <laughs> or, or like that. And, uh, and this gets to one of my favorite things uh, ever. And that, if, did anybody ever read D.T. Suzuki's Essays in Zen Buddhism? Nancy Michael, Michael did. Okay. This, this um, he writes that, that when you're 15, when you hit about 15, you have no idea what's going on. And then it takes you until about the age of 30 to even know where to stand. Right, which is exactly what Confucius said, by the way. And, and, and then he said, at that point, 
you have to choose. Hello, camera. Can you still see me? Yes, I think so. Uh, you have to choose between the everlasting yes and the everlasting no. And I'm very fond of this because when I read this when I was 15, uh, it hooked me on Buddhism. This is my whole, and I'll tell you exactly the passage that did it. I'm going to read it to you. Um, and it gets to the attitude about life. Uh, exactly the question about whether you choose to be reincarnated or not. Um, we are too ego-centered. The ego shell in which we live is the hardest thing to outgrow. We seem to carry it all the time from childhood up to the time we finally pass away. We are, however, given many chances to break through this shell, and the first and greatest of them is when we reach adolescence. This is the first time the ego really comes to recognize the other. I mean, the awakening of sexual love. Now you can see why I liked it. Uh, I was 15, right? And really got me, right? An ego, entire and undivided, now begins to feel a sort of split in itself. Love, hitherto dormant, deep in his heart, lifts its head and causes a great commotion. For the love now stirred demands at once the assertion of the ego and its annihilation. Love makes the ego lose itself in the object it loves, and yet at the same time it wants to have that object as its own. Okay, that totally, that totally got me. But it's again, this goes to you know, one's, one's basic attitude. And so when we ask these questions, either from a technological point or from the point of view of what do you choose, we get tremendous insight about our motivation, who we are. Um, so here, here's another one. Um, I'm almost done with these questions. You know, would you want to live again, right, if you had no memory of your present life? Sarah says yes. Don says yes. Doesn't change anything, right? Right? Tim, yes. Okay. Yeah? Yes. Sam says yes. Okay. So, uh, so here's the question. Um, did you answer this question yes in your previous life? <laughs> Is that why you're here? And now you may say, that we're giving a little bit too much credence to volition here, what you want. After all, what's going to happen is just going to happen anyway. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay? So, so in this, this notion of would you want to live again as opposed to just die and it's over, right? Go to the place that you think you were before you were born, right? And then the question is, is existence better than non-existence. Let's think about that. Let's meditate on it. Let's take 20 seconds only and think about that. Is existence better than non-existence? Let's go. Do you like thinking about them both together? Yeah, where we come at. How many people say existence is better than non-existence? Raise hands. How many people say non-existence is better than existence? Okay, how many people say doesn't matter, they're both pretty much the same? Yeah. Yeah, now, what I find when I do this little meditation, it's really helpful to me because being someone who's really scared of, of, of death, um, just being able to sit with existence and non-existence, right? Not like non-existence, oh my God, non-existence, no! Um, but, but as a little trick, when you think about them both, existence and non-existence, and all of a sudden you're thinking about non-existence, but it's not really scary because you're also thinking about it, it becomes a little friendly, like this, I like it. Um, so, so, but remember though, you really don't have to choose because when you do become Buddha, you will realize that things exist and you exist and you don't exist. Both. There is no contradiction from the point of view of, of a Buddha, which is something to wonder at, but also that we can take in our hearts and, 
and feel as a kind of, it's okay. It's really okay. Here's the last question I have for you tonight. Could this be a simulation? Someone's high school chemistry experiment in some advanced, you know, very advanced creatures, high school. Could this be a simulation? How many people say yes? How many people say no? How many people say beats the shit out of me? <laughs> okay. So, so this brings up a whole other bag of tricks, right? We're, all, we're already running very complex uh, uh, simulations in our civilization right here, rudimentary as it is, in physics, astrophysics, climatology, economics, psychology, engineering. We use simulations to learn how to fly, to perfect surgical technique. Do we? Hannah says yes to predict the weather and effects of climate change, right? And of course, mostly we use them for games, right? The games are extraordinary these days. So, so Nick Bostrom of Oxford, he makes what he calls the simulation argument. And the simulation argument goes like this. Um, one of these three things has to be true. Either no civilization in the universe ever reached the technical level that they could run a fine-grained simulation. Fine-grained meaning realistic like this, right? Either no civilization, the whole history of every universe going back as many eons as you can count, no, either nobody reached it or, or somebody reached it, but of the people who reached it or the things that reached it or the computers that reached it, there was no interest in running ancestor simulations to see where they came from, right? So either they didn't get there, number one. They got there and they didn't care to run any simulations about ancestors, number two. And so if neither of those is true, then he says, number three, this is most definitely a simulation. Because the logic being that if any civilization reached it and started running simulations, they could run billions and billions and trillions of simulations. And there's no reason to think that we are not a simulation. We most likely are. And now Bostrom also, for some reason, he has this um, qualification of running ancestor simulations. I've thought about it a bunch. Um, I don't think you need that. Uh, it could be any kind of simulation, I think, which makes it even more likely that this is a, is a simulation. So. So let's think about this uh, for a minute. Uh, and he puts it, by the way, chances about one in three. And he goes to Oxford, you know, he's Oxford, he's a scholar at Oxford. He does not speak with an English accent because he's Swedish, but he speaks with an accent, which makes the whole thing more impressive. <laughs> um, so, so this means there's a good chance that we're living in Westworld, <laughs> that we are simulated, yeah. Oh, yeah. That it's actually a simulation. Like, it just reads as if, because it's logically true, it is true. You don't think, you don't think the existence of Donald Trump as president proves we're in a simulation? <laughs> okay, so, okay here's, another, here's another way to get to the same place. Okay, let's, let's go with this one. It's, it's Isaac Asimov's, because these things often start in science fiction. Great uh, short story, The Last Question. Right? It's May 21, 2061, and these two computer scientists are sitting around with their multi-vac computer, huge computer, and they're getting concerned about the heat death of the universe. You know. And then, so Asimov writes that one of them, Adele, was just drunk enough to try, just sober enough to be able to phrase the necessary symbols and operations in order to input into the computer. The question which in words might have corresponded to this, will mankind one day without the net expenditure of energy be able to restore the sun to its full youthfulness even after it has died of old age? Or maybe it could be put more simply like this. How can the net amount of entropy of the universe, that is the, um, the, the uh, separation of, 
of matter of the universe, uh, the entropy of the universe, be massively decreased. Multivac fell dead and silent. The slow flashing of light ceased. The distant sounds of clicking relays ended. Then, just as the frightened technicians felt they could hold their breath no longer, there was a sudden springing to life of the teletype attached to that portion of the multivac. Five words were printed. Insufficient data for meaningful answer. And this question gets asked again and again through the short story as humanity progresses, and the answer is the same, insufficient data. And then in the distant future, just before the end of the universe, the last man or woman asks the question, and the answer is the same, insufficient data to give a meaningful answer. But then that's the end of humanity, the, the universe is totally run down, it's gone. But somehow in the short story, the computer keeps working, and, uh, and finally, it yields the answer. Let there be light. And there was light. It's a great story. Like, what? <laughs> what? What? So let's look at the Bible, right? That's from Genesis chapter 1. You know, let there, chapter 1, verse 1, let there be light. The waters, the earth, you know, all of that. And then... In verse 26 in chapter 1, the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and then let them have dominion over the sea and over the fowl and the cattle and the earth and everything that creepeth. I love that word. <laughs> the next verse. So God created man in his own image. Simulation. God created man in his own image. Um, and he blessed them to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion again. And that's pretty much what happened. We have so much dominion that we've almost destroyed the place. Um, but the Bible doesn't say how the heavens and earth and humans were created other than from dust. Right? The Hebrew word is afar which some people say is, has to do with the etymology of Africa. Um, probably not true, but I don't know. And what it connotes, the word afar, is very fine particles. One scholar writes, um, everything on earth broken down to its lowest component. Sounds like what we now call the Planck length, which is at least pretty close to the smallest thing there can be, if not the smallest thing there can be. And it's roughly the order of magnitude at which uh, quantum effects rather than classical physics uh, obtain. Hmm. Maybe there's something to that Bible. Man being created. Let us make man in our own image made from some kind of quantum process. Now, um, so Bostrom's smart dude, Oxford accent. Um, uh, and the Bible is, well, the Bible, right? So let's go with it. Okay, let's assume. Simulation. Here we are. Does it matter? Show of hands. Who says it matters? Who says it doesn't matter? Why doesn't it matter? Anybody? Just curious. Still stuck in the simulation. Still stuck in the simulation. Okay. Okay. Now, it doesn't matter. Here's one thing to think about. If this is a simulation, this is simulation, well, it could account for miracles. What is a miracle? Something that violates the laws of physics. If we're in a simulation, change the rule. Right, okay, let's let this guy walk on water just this time. And there you go. It's a perfect explanation. And what about glitches in the simulation? I already mentioned Trump. That's just, that's just a blue state thing. Okay, but what about all these things we associate with the paranormal? Um, UFOs, out-of-body experience, past life regression. I talked about that a bit in, in the last couple talks. Um, 
Now, do these things only happen in California? Okay, so, oh, okay. So I was at a party in L.A. And yes, it was a Burning Man party. And I'm, t and, and I'm, I'm talking to people. I'm talking to this woman, Arielle. And she tells me how she saw up in Topanga UFOs three times. And I'm thinking, um, and she's blonde too. And I, that, that doesn't have to do with anything. But then I'm thinking to myself, but I'm thinking to myself, wow, I'm finally in LA. I'm at a party and somebody's telling me about UFOs. That's really cool. And so I'm gleefully, the next day, I met one of my former students, uh, uh, Tina. You remember Tina? You remember Tina? General studies student. Anyway, Tina, um, uh, daughter of Chinese immigrants, nobody's fool, extremely down to earth. And I'm telling Tina this. I'm saying, yeah, I felt like I really got to L.A. Isn't that cool? And she's telling me about UFOs. And Tina looks at me and she says, uh, David, I saw them three times in Brooklyn. <laughs> and so then I, started, then I started asking people about uh, UFO sightings. And I found a fair number of people who just would sit there just like this and, and tell me, and I know them, and I didn't think they were crazy, and I didn't think they were making it up. I don't know what to do with that. So then I told you also about some of these other crazy things that I encountered. And just show of hands, how many of you have ever encountered some crazy story like that from somebody who you, you know, basically believe that you didn't know what to do with? All right, some people, yeah, some people, maybe a third, third of you. Um, so, so could this be a part, could this be a glitch in the simulation, these things? Or um, some rules of the simulation we don't understand. And then um, there's a great, um, you know, Hans Moravec is a uh, tremendous uh, roboticist, has been at Carnegie Mellon for some time. So he wrote all these great books back in the 80s and 90s. And one of the great ones is Mind Children. And he's writing about artificial intelligence and simulations, et cetera. And he sketches out this wonderful uh, scenario where this one simulated civilization like us decide they're going to try to get in touch with their simulators. So they start sending signals. And eventually, they do. And they start communicating with their simulators. They're called the Celtics and the New Ways. Not Celtics like Boston, but, you know, I don't know. So, uh, and, 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 and then they start collaborating. But of course, on Bostrom's logic, if this is a simulation, that also applies to whoever simulated us. That has to be a simulation. So it's simulations all the way up and down. So at least we have to admit that this is a possibility. Now, does it make any difference? Most of you said no. Does it make you think, if this is a simulation, does it make you think that this is somehow less real? Less real? How many people feel less real if it's a simulation? I feel it's less real. Yeah. Anyway, so um, interesting though because the Buddhists say, back to Buddhism, the Buddhists say that life is like illusion, like a magic trick. And this is, we talked about this last time, this is the whole notion of, of the Buddhists, they call it conventional reality. Because there are two kinds of things. There's conventional realities and ultimate realities. And ultimate realities is just that things are not overdone or underdone. They're empty of that overdoneness or underdoneness. Right? That's ultimate reality. But then the things appear to exist. But because they're really empty of overdoneness or underdoneness, the Buddhists call that kunzop denba, which in, in, in Tibetan, which really means a deceiver kind of truth. Deceptive, like a magic trick. It's a mirage. It appears to be there, but it's really not there the way you think it is. So, yeah, Tim? A really important four letter word because I have given this some thought in the past, and the word is like. So, mm -hmm. some people criticize the Buddhists because they say, oh, the Buddhists say that life is an illusion. Right. It's like, no, you missed that one word. Right. 
compact, easily carried around, right. and super important. Yeah. It's like an illusion. It's like an illusion. In what way is it like an illusion? Not, mm -hmm. It isn't illusion. Right. And the, you know, that's the difference between Hindu and Buddhist doctrine. Hindus say it's maya, it is illusion. The only thing that is here is atma, that's here, it really exists. Buddhists aren't like that. Buddhists say it's like illusion. Very much like a simulation. So if we think, if we think about, once again, here's a back door. Normally, we think, oh yeah, this is really happening. Re really, ha wow, it's a re real hand, it's a real guy, you know, right? So this is really happening, but, um, but if we let ourselves go a little bit, say, okay, pretty good chance this is a simulation, and sort of go there, then it can make it easier for us to experience exactly what Tim says, that this is like an illusion. So, again, so again, technology, you don't have to believe any of the Buddha stuff. You don't have to bow down to Buddha or believe in these, you know, old Tibetan and Sanskrit texts. You can just think about simulations and Nick Bostrom at Oxford and get a feel for what it might like, be like to be like illusion. And of course, if things are like illusion, then illusion like me can interact with illusion like you without any barrier, in, in freedom. It's like a dance. It's, it's easier. Yeah. Bradley. Because everything is, as Tim said, like illusion. Not illusion, it's there. But it's there in a deceptive kind of way because, why? Because we overdo it. We like dive in instead of saying, hey, okay, there you guys are, let's play, right? Let's have fun, let's help each other. Instead then it's, that one looks better than me. I want that one to think well of me. You know, and it just gets into a terribly messy thing. So, so the like illusion can help. But you're right. You go too far with any of these things, then you can end up in trouble. Right? Just like the, the remedy of saying, okay, nothing exists. Like, like uh, Kaya and my teacher says to me, he says, you don't exist. I don't exist. This translation doesn't exist, can be really great medicine for us who are just overdoing, thinking something exists. It's the same thing, same way, with like illusion and a simulation. So it's another way that computer technology, advanced technology, can help us embrace Buddhist principles. Now, that's the first, so the first reason was that we talk about technology is it helps us understand religion and even, even principles of Buddhism. The second reason is, because technology is changing everything. Question, how many of you have your devices on you? Okay, okay, let's take out our devices. Okay, take out your device. If you have them, if you don't have it, that's all right. You sit this one out or look at somebody else's device. Okay, look at your device now. Don't... Uh, try, well, do whatever you want, but okay. Okay, take them out, look at them now. Now, as you hold your device, right, who are you? I have a question. Is your device, does your device feel like part of you or not part of you, something different? Who says device feels like part of them? Be honest. Who says device is merely an object like any other object? Okay, I'd say we have, you know, some people who still are sane. Um, I, by the way, would, I feel very much like it's a part of me, okay? Um, now, um, imagine now you take your, your flashlight, right? The flashlight holder thing, and you look at your device. Let's do that. Holding a flashlight, looking at the device. Now remember now, as you look at your flashlight, with your flashlight, you, you're aware of yourself, you're holding the device, and you're aware also of, 
everything around and all your feelings about the device. All right, it's just getting familiar with our device. And now let's switch and become the flashlight itself, not the holder. Flashlight itself. You're just the flashlight. So all that other stuff, perspective just dissolved, went away. Now back to the flashlight holder. Um, do anything for anybody? You get any perspective on your, that's kind of too short, but you start to get a little perspective on this thing that is so uh, determinative in so many ways. I'm really glad to see that a number of you, um, a number of you have a certain kind of objectivity with your device, and that's good, but a number of us don't. Tim? I think I might, I'm, this could be another illusion, but I feel like the ans my answer to the question is more complex than that. So I don't feel like this is a part of me, but I do feel like I've put things in it that this won't hold so that it can hold them for me. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a portal through which I mm -hmm. can look into other places and things. It's and true. I don't feel like that chair is the same kind of object. Right. So do you feel that maybe it's intermediate between it's part of you? It's an extension of me. It's an extension. Okay. So how, let me ask a question. How many of you feel that your device is an extension of you? In the same way I would use a book if I didn't have my, my phone. All right. How many of you feel that the device is more of an extension of you than a book would be. Okay, so I would suggest that if it's an extension of you, then that's pretty much the same thing as saying it's part of you. I mean, let's not mince words. I mean, right? It's not that, it's a little bit less obnoxious, you know, but... Would part of you? Would a notebook be part of you? Depends how attached I was to my notebook. Yeah, no, but what, what, it's true, it could be, but I think, at least in my case, and maybe in the case of many of you, but not you, Don, okay, um, it feels more like that. Like, I feel like the device is more a part of me than a notebook would be, or than, you know, any ordinary tool would be. And so, at least for those of us who feel that way, and it's not universal, and I'm not suggesting it should be, to the contrary, I think it's better that it's not. But we're already cyborgs. You know, that's, that's, I think, what it means, that the transformation is actually, is actually taking place. Um, so this is, a huge, this is a huge change. We haven't related to objects like this before, to technological objects. Now, I suggest that going back and forth looking at it, meditating on it, becoming familiar with it and your relationship to it is a, is a healthy thing to do. You might ask yourself, how much attention of mine does my device take when I'm looking at it? You know, 10%, 20%, 2%, 90% as a way of becoming aware because the devices now are part of our water. Right? And just like everything else, all of our preconceptions and biases, the device becomes automatic too, and we don't see it. So this kind of using the flashlight, then becoming the flashlight, then using the flashlight, can be applied to the device. And I think it's maybe a good thing to investigate. Now, religion and spirituality, and technology and religion have been, technology and religion have been very close for years and years and years. They just, uh, a few years ago, um, made a discovery of um, uh, temples that were built by hunter-gatherers seven millennia before the, the Temple of Giza. And, and this is a long, long, long time ago. And we used to think that temples were really the project of a settled agrarian society. That's how we all learned it in school. We we're learning something different. So what we have is that the history of the relationship between a technology uh, and religion goes way, 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 way back, maybe further than we imagine. Now this was in, it's in the desert, so you could simplify it and say that actually civilization comes from Burning Man, or not Burning Man today, but Burning Man 
uh, many, many, many millennia ago. That is a fundamental connection. And, and, and so even then, there was a relationship between technology and religion, and now it, it permeates it. And for those of you who are millennials or just post-millennial, uh, you may be uh, witnessing the most precipitous change ever because it could be that instead of religion being the arbiter of meaning of life and spirituality, it could be superintelligence, augmented reality, uh, and the like. And is it okay? Is it, is it inevitable? You know, the, chances are it will be a world of superintelligence. We already have computers being victorious at the game of Go, at chess, all these things that said, you know, we, we couldn't, it couldn't be. And there, and there, uh, the technology is getting better and better and better. They beat a bunch of Texans at uh, artificial intelligence, beat some Texans at, at poker. I don't know if they're drinking tequila, but they, but the computer beat them. And of course, you deal with super, with super intelligence of a kind whenever you do a Google search, because Google is, is, you're teaching the algorithm how to think. And this is how they learn. And uh, even more disturbing than that, perhaps disturbing, perhaps this could save us. Uh, Google's Eric Schmidt said, uh, he was before he was at Google, he said, you give us more information about you, about your friends, and we can improve the quality of our searches. We don't need you to type at all. We know where you are. We know where you've been. We can more or less know what you're thinking about. And when I was writing this, I was on a plane. And I was sitting next to a 28-year-old engineer from, uh, from Kuwait, Mohammed. And he told me this. He and his friend, a couple weeks ago, were just talking about BMWs. A minute later, there was an ad on his phone for a BMW that had never appeared before. Did that ever happen to any of you? Yeah. Same thing, you were just talking about it. All the time. All the, you were just talking, thinking about it. <laughs> right, you were just talking about it, and there it is. So, um, Shoshana Zuboff just wrote this fantastic book. Anybody, uh, anybody read it? The Age of Surveillance Capitalism? Got it? Oh. Yeah, in our class. Right, okay. So what she, she talks about a new form of capitalism that is so predatory it makes the robber barons look like children. Um, and she's talking about how the tech robber barons led by Google uh, you know, boldly grabbed all of the personal data created by the internet and social media and are using it not only to sell us things but to shape our behavior and our very conceptions of, of who we are. I really recommend this to you. I'll just read to you a little bit of it. Her definition of surveillance capitalism is, one, a new economic order that claims human experience as free, more, as free raw material for hidden commercial practices of extraction, prediction, and sales. Two, a parasitic economic logic in which the production of goods and services is subordinated to a new global architecture of behavioral modification and down a little bit, five, as significant a threat to human nature in the 21st century as industrial capitalism was to the natural world in the 19th and 20th, seven, a movement that aims to impose a new collective order based on total certainty, and last, an expropriation of critical human rights that is best understood as a coup from above, an overthrow of the people's sovereignty. And she puts it to us that uh, are we going to just say, oh, it's inevitable and not care? Or can we reclaim some sense of humanity and some sense of choice? It's the same issue, in a way, as we face with our phones. Some of us are able to kind of retain our humanity in looking at phones, and other ones of us who may tend to be more addictive-type personalities, yeah, um, you know, feel more of a more of a part of it and less distance. But this is happening, this is happening globally. Now, some of the th now one of the things that my students said when we discussed a few weeks ago, I don't remember if it was you, Brad, or somebody else, they said, wait a minute. Oh, no, Sarah, was it you? Didn't they say the same thing when writing was invented? Could have been something you said, okay. So, uh, 
So, yes, it's true. When writing was invented, um, Plato and his Phaedrus, he wrote the following. Right? This is so interesting. This discovery of yours, writing, right, will create forgetfulness in the learner's souls because they will not use their memories. They will trust to the external written characters and not remember of themselves. The specific, which you have, specific thing which you have discovered is an aid not to memory but to reminiscence. And you give your disciples not truth but the semblance of truth. They will be hearers of many things and they will have learned nothing. They will appear to be omniscient and will generally know nothing. Oh, I don't mean you. Okay. They will be tiresome company. I don't mean you. Okay. Uh, having the show of wisdom without the reality. Right? So what do you think? What do you think? Are, are, do you think that we are becoming more tiresome company because of the uh, uh, impact of technology? Who says yes? Who says no? I'd say the yeses kind of have it there. Okay. Did Einstein say something about uh, it's not worth to remember things that you can look up in a book? Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe he was, maybe he was losing it too. Yeah, yeah, Bradley. I mean, along these lines, I feel like the question of whether the, the device is an extension of us, I feel like the question is more, is the data an extension of the mm -hmm. part of you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think you put it that way too. Now, now let's, but this all has to do with consciousness, yes? So we should talk about consciousness. We haven't talked about consciousness yet. Tim. But just before that, I've heard somebody from another tradition that is not Buddhism argue <clears throat> essentially that because we're a product of all the conditioning and experiences that we've had since our birth, that free will is illusory and the choices that we make are all based on those conditions that have occurred in the past. And so in that model, Google's or the surveillance capitalists would just be putting a new push in the mix as opposed to creating something that didn't exist before. Right? Well, but I would, I would say there's a big difference between something at the level of 100 and something at the level of 10. And so with the incredible tools and addictive technology that exists and they're having all the data of everything you've ever done mm -hmm. and can then feed it back to you. So you're walking down the street and buzz your phone goes and says, maybe you should buy something over there. It knows you want over there. And all of a sudden, you're going over there. When otherwise, you might have walked down the street and you know, said hello to somebody and met somebody and you know, who knows what. So, so the, the, the question is the degree of intrusion. Mm -hmm. I was only pointing out that maybe people who think that free will exists absolutely would feel that something has been taken away from them, which is different from right. feeling that their right. non-existent free will right. is being toyed with. Right, and this is the same kind of argument that I got in class when saying, wait a minute, what about writing? Right, there are all kinds of ways in which our, our freedom is impinged upon. We either do it to ourselves or the culture does it. This is very much the water that we were talking about in the first two sessions to be able to see those things, you have to withdraw from them. And then you see them. And then once you see them, you can start to deal with them and maybe recapture or get a certain amount of freedom. Right? So, so, but all this comes down very much to consciousness. So let's talk about it. You know, what is consciousness? Layla's favorite subject. Okay, so... So we don't know exactly how machines learn, right? How advanced algorithms do what they do. Um, and we don't even know how we learn. This is, or we experience consciousness. This is a so-called hard problem of consciousness. Um, think about that. There's a big mystery at the heart of both technology, advanced technology, and ourselves. And and, and where does consciousness come from? There are basically two schools of thought on this. There's the physicalist, materialist school, which says it's all a function of brain and neurons and chemistry and chemicals um, emerging from complex structures. We don't know exactly how. Uh, and that's one view. And the other view is a dualist view that says that, yes, there's all that material stuff, but consciousness is something else. Very, 
much like Descartes wrote about in his meditations, and, uh, and it happens to be the Buddhist view in many ways as well. Now, the physicalist materialist, the, the, the dualist criticize the materialist physicalist view of consciousness and say, but you can't tell us how it happens. That doesn't mean that it's not right because the, we're at the beginning of these studies and it could well be that we'll figure out how consciousness emerges from purely material, physical things, just from the brain. It doesn't have to be. But for now, for now, at least right now, there's a big gap in, our, in, the, in the physicalist, materialist um, understanding of the world and it has to do with what does it feel like to feel the rain, to smell the flower, to feel in love, these things called qualia. What is it like to be a bat? What is it like to be a person, right? What is it like to be kaya, right? All of these things, that, those, those we have no explanation for. Now on the other hand, Buddhists, call them psychonauts, meditators, have deep experience in subjective consciousness. That's what they do. That's what you do when you go to the cave for 30 years and you sit and meditate. You're going within. So on the one hand, we have tremendous um, objective science now, trying to figure out through neuroscience all the connections and how it's possible that consciousness comes from, comes from this. Right? And then we have the Buddhist meditators for years, and not only Buddhists, but others, who have been uh, exploring it from a subjective point of view. Now, the Buddhists take a dualistic view of consciousness. And the most important philosophical text in this regard is uh, Dharmakirti's Commentary on Valid Cognition, which was probably written, uh, he lived about 600 to 660 A.D., he was commenting on Dignago, who lived before him. But, but his basic argument in this Pramanavartika, uh, this treatise on valid cognition, is based on Buddha's extraordinary compassion. He argues that, that thought can't depend on the body and compassion as a kind of thought but had to be the result of many lifetimes of practice and purification. And the principle, so, so it's kind of an experiential thing. How could anyone become so compassionate and so insightful in, in just one lifetime? But, but he also assumes, the Dharmakirti does, and so does Gelek Rinpoche in his book, Good Life, Good Death. And His Holiness makes the same argument um, that, that sentient things, the cause of sentience, of consciousness, must be something else that is conscious. And that it doesn't make sense that consciousness could come from something non-conscious, like a, a rock or a tree, because otherwise the argument goes that everything would be conscious, because all these non-conscious things would make things that are conscious. Um, that, that, that any cognition, the cause of any cognition is the immediately preceding moment of cognition. And this is debated in the Buddhist monasteries in the sense of making sure that they really, really understand this. And, and so the mind of a, of a baby who is just born, the cause of that mind has to be a previous mind. Um, now one could argue that this is circular reasoning. And it all depends on this initial definition that consciousness can only arise from consciousness. And I have to confess that um, I've never been that moved by the Buddhist argument. Um, and this could be because I come from a very materialistic culture, right? So I can, I can, I can easily imagine that it could be that from stuff, consciousness could emerge. It doesn't shock me, it doesn't offend me. But here, Science may come to the rescue, and I say to the rescue because in order for me, speaking personally, to embark upon practice and change, I have to think it's attainable, right? So if I'm thinking 
gee, I want to really maximize this life and my efforts here won't be wasted. They will continue and I will see if I can benefit people, others in this life and then I can, in next life and next life, how wonderful that would be. So, so science may, may be very important here to give, to give the motivation that reading Dharmakirti or even hearing His Holiness might not give. Right? And this could be just a failing of mine because there may be a perfectly valid way of looking at things if you look at His Holiness and you say, wow, he's, he's quite a person, he's quite a bodhisattva, so brilliant. And just like go with Kurzweil because he's a smart dude, well, if you go with Kurzweil about the singularity, you should definitely go with His Holiness about anything he says, right? So that's a perfectly respect, respectable and logical way to go. That's how we function in life, right? Starting with our parents, hopefully they give us good examples. We look for good examples. But for those of us who are afflicted, like me, with some skepticism, I spent, I spent like 40 years as a lawyer. Um, science may be helpful. I'll get to that in, in a little bit. So, um, but, but we need, in order to practice, in order to fulfill our higher ideals, in order to live life in the best way we can, we need, we need some faith. We need some faith in something. And uh, you could argue that when we think about, for example, Dalai Lama, that this is helping restructure our consciousness, our measuring device. And according to quantum mechanics, I'll get to that in a minute, you know, the, the kind of measuring device you use determines your outcome, which, which in a way we all know. We all know if you, come, if you come to something and you're all pissed off about something, that's going to condition how you see something. Quantum mechanics takes a little bit further, right, that everything that we see is the product of our interaction with it. I won't say it's the product of consciousness. That may go a little too far. So when I asked Joms Paul, um, our wonderful teacher, about reincarnation, he said, we have to have faith. Um, so, so why even put these things together as, as I'm coming to now, as you probably can tell? Is that about 8.15? Okay, good. Um, religion and science. A quote from Erwin Schrodinger, who was the, uh, one of the fathers of quantum mechanics, he wrote, it seems plain and self-evident, yet needs to be said, that isolated knowledge obtained by specialists in a narrow field has in itself no value whatsoever, but only in its synthesis with all the rest of knowledge. Right? And what is religion anyway but the science of things we don't understand. Religion is the science of things we don't understand. It's similar to what Arthur C. Clarke said about uh, any sufficiently advanced technology and being indistinguishable from magic. So there's, there's a relationship here. Now there are scientific theories about consciousness that try to bridge the gap between brain states and qualia. That is, all the stuff that goes on in our neurons and what it feels like to experience them. We have integrated uh, information theory, which says we take consciousness as a given. And then even further than that, the great physicist John Wheeler, who wrote a paper in which he suggested that it, meaning material, all this stuff, comes from bit. Called it it from bit. Comes from information. So information being the basic stuff of the universe another way for us to go and explore in terms of how we might motivate ourselves to have the faith to follow at least Buddhist teachings in terms of reincarnation. Now, now what does the Bible say about consciousness? I keep coming back to the Bible here. It's really great. Um, right? And whatever 
um, is Genesis uh, 2, verse 19. You didn't know you were coming to church. Um, the Bible says, out of the ground, um, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Right? So Adam was conscious from the beginning, made that way by God, simulation or not. Then uh, something else happened right after that. I think we all know what that was. Um, if you eat the apple from yonder tree, the snake, the serpent said to the woman, then contrary to what God told you just now, you surely will not die. As God had said, if you eat the apple, you'll die. Right? For God knows, says the serpent, the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And the rest is history. So God made us conscious, according to the Bible. The serpent gave us our sense of right and wrong. Right? And then God said, behold, the man is become as one of us. This is uh, Genesis 3, verse 22. As one of us, I've always wondered about the plural there. Um, uh, to know good and evil, uh, and then gets thrown out of the garden, throws them out of the garden, Eden, and, and puts a flaming sword which turns every which way um, to keep them out. Um, one, I was looking at some Bible sites, and as a Bible scholar who wrote, I don't think he meant it like this, he said, God also programmed language into Adam and Eve. Um, so if we follow the Bible's logic, then who's going to give these machines uh, a sense of right and wrong? Right? We have a whole, call it mythology, or call it revelation, about sense of right and wrong. Where does it, where does it go? You know, in the latest, latest issue of the machine, Institute, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, MIRI, which is a really good, really good thing to look at if you want to keep current on some papers about development of artificial intelligence and how, and the steps we should take to be careful about it. Um, there's in a recent article, talks about whether it's a good idea to actually instill human modeling in machine intelligence. And the conclusion is either you've got to do it really well or you shouldn't do it at all. Um, so, so we have to think about this. And what about the Buddhists, right? The Buddhists, of course, think that a moment of intelligence can only come from a prior moment of intelligence. So then, could it be that machine intelligence arises from our intelligence so that in some fashion there's a transference of ethics or karma and that AIs will get their consciousnesses from us, right? Or if Wheeler is right, and it comes from bit, that consciousness is the main substance in the universe, then it could be that computers will get their consciousness from somewhere not from us. They will develop their own form of intelligence, which may be very different than anything we can imagine. So what kind of mind children are we incubating here? Uh, it's, a big, it's a big issue, especially for you millennials and just post-millennials because you're going to see it. You're going to see it happen. We all have to work together on it. So of course, if, if Kurzweil, now let's go, if Kurzweil is right and we're heading toward the singularity in 2045, right? Do people still have children? You're going to live forever, have infinite intelligence. You could create children in VR and get rid of them when they're annoying, <laughs> right? You, you could do that. Why, why would you have biological children? And without death, if you could go there, if you could upload yourself into some heavenly realm, you could do it. Why pray? Why be good, right? So these are all questions. And now when we add to that the fact that a lot of the artificial intelligence research is done in the military, who don't have the same goals as the rest of us, we, we get to some really interesting questions that are really important for all of us to, grasp, to grapple with, and I submit, 
are too important to be left to the geeks alone. That those who are trained as engineers, computer scientists, obviously have a tremendous amount to give in this in terms of you know, knowledge, expertise, but this is something for all of us, and that's why what we do at Columbia is we try to get everybody together all across disciplines, and we have these kinds of conversations, and that's another reason why I thought it was very important tonight to bring this to you guys, a wider, a wider audience in terms of this, but you know, come from all kinds of walks of life, different expertises, because it's something that's very important for us all to think about. Now, at the end here, um, if you're still alive, you okay? You still good? Yeah. Well, any questions about anything or comments? Okay. What I want to just end up with is some more on, uh, on quantum mechanics, which, um, you know, really brings you, when you talk about this in the context of a religion department or humanities in a university, you're on the lunatic fringe. Uh, uh, I really don't care. Like I said before, fools rush in. I was, I was driving down here. Does anybody like a Young the Giant? Like Young the Giant? I was listening, so I was actually driving down here and the song was going on. It's, the song is called Superposition. Do you know it? It says, what you don't understand, superposition. That kind of sums up this whole, this whole part of the lecture. So last time I sketched out um, what I started to think about in terms of, of Michael Lockwood's many minds theory of quantum mechanics and Everett's uh, many worlds theory of quantum mechanics and how uh, this may be one way that we can create the illusory body and tantric practice and we talked about that all, all through the modality of practice. Right, and I asked myself, and I talked about, like, why, why is it that in all these practices, you know, you take the commitment to do practices over and over and over and over and over again, right? What you're doing then in that practice and visualizing in greater and greater details, you visualize the mandala, the, you know, however many deities, the palace, the arms, the legs, the jewelry, the hair, everything. Um, you're, de you're dealing with intense observation, and it could well be, and I talked about this last time, in terms of um, the paths you go down in interacting with things, that you're actually creating a kind of reality, because at least according to the Buddhists, the way to become a Buddha is eventually, from a state of emptiness, you create uh, your next being, the so-called Sambhogakaya of Buddha, the enjoyment body of Buddha, uh, as, as a product of mind and energy. And then, from that state, you actually create the physical manifestation of Buddha, the Nirmanakaya Buddha, and go back in the world and help people. Because that's the only reason that you started all these practices in the first place. Because you just couldn't take it when you looked around and you saw people, animals, suffering. Um, so, here's, a, here's another one. Okay, here's another one. So, I was reading... Richard Feynman's book, QED, uh, Quantum Electrodynamics, about the physics of light. And, uh, okay, I'm seeing Don's skepticism already. And, and am I right? Oh, yeah, okay. So, so anyway, so he's writing about light, and he's writing how, you know, normally speaking, if you have like a measuring device over there, and you have a mirror, say down here on the floor, and, and you shoot the light from a, our flashlight uh, down this way, it pretty much, you, know, you assume classically that it hits at 45 degrees going up here, and that goes up 45 degrees there, and hits the light source like that, it makes sense. And what Feynman says is that quantum mechanically, that's all statistics, that when you measure what's happening, it's true that most of the photons are going from here and are hitting right around the middle of the mirror and then bouncing up, because that's where you're pointing the flashlight, and then bouncing up like that. But actually, the distribution of photons is like a curve, right? Centering with most of them over the middle, but some of them hitting right straight down here and then going 
like that at a totally different angle. And, and this, this is contrary to classical physics, to our assumptions of classical physics, and it's really contrary to our logic. Right? So, so in explaining the way this works, he's saying that in some instances, rare, things will happen that are contrary to logic and, and, and certainly contrary to classical mechanics. Right? Now, I had a long discussion with, uh, with physicist friends of mine and, uh, you know, of course, say, well, this has got nothing to do with miracles, right? That's good. Because, you know, of course, I'm a religion person. I immediately say, well, what that basically says is a small number of things that happen we can't explain, right? According to quantum physics, a small number of things we can't explain, and contrary to our everyday logic. Um, so, you know, so we have that, so we have that discussion, and, and the physicists say, well, but we will understand it. We don't understand it now but we will understand it. But I don't think that's really necessarily inconsistent with at this point, if you want to call it a miracle, if you're that kind of person, call it a miracle and say that's, that's kind of the nature of our world right now. Some things will happen we don't understand. Or, or what about the case we talked about last time? It's a kid in Cambodia, a four-year-old, and he says, um, starts talking and he says, well, I was married to so-and-so, I come from this village over there, and, and, and I had these kids, and then they eventually bring him to the village, and Ian Stevenson from the University of Virginia, who's now gone, but had a whole team uh, go with the person, and they document how the kid walks in, and he says, uh, recognizes everybody, and he's never been to the village, and nobody in his village was ever at the village, so, you know, how do you, how do you explain that? Well, once again... Once again, science for a skeptic like me, or maybe if you combine my skepticism with my uh, naivete and lack of knowledge about the deeper aspects of science, but it may not matter. Whatever it takes, it takes. Um, I always wondered, well, how can you explain these reincarnation memories if there's no self that goes from life to life. How does that make any sense? And, and especially, what if it turns out that the physicalist materialists are right about consciousness? That basically when you're dead, you're dead, right? How would this explain these phenomena? And so then I started thinking um, that physics could help now, not in the sense of what I'm about to say is right, because I just don't have the expertise, but in the sense of helping me understand how you can have reincarnation without a self. And how physics helps is there's a notion of what we call quantum entanglement, where two particles that have been together at some point, even if they're now separated by, you know, eight trillion miles, if one of them has a spin up, the other one has a spin down. That they're related and it doesn't, and, and you couldn't communicate from one to the other because it's so far, and it's been experimentally verified that this is true, that there's this entanglement. So I thought to myself, what if, I just, well, what if we just thought of, these, of reincarnation as a transfer of information? Because after all, if I, you know, if and when I die, not maybe when, okay, um, when? Okay. Um, okay. So, so when I die, say, um, turns out that there's a kid born, and the kid, kid says, I remember, wait, I remember I was giving this talk. It was a Tibet house. You know, and the kid lives in, you know, maybe Barcelona somewhere, the kid's four years old. It's a Tibet house, and, and you know, Hannah was there, and Charlotte was there. I don't even know who they are, but I, you know, and how do you explain that without a self? Because the Buddhists themselves say no self. Well, if we think, maybe if we think, what if we thought of what we call reincarnation as really being a, a species of information transfer? Somehow, the memories transfer because that kid who was born, that kid's not me. 
kid might be what we call my reincarnation, but not me. It's always been so hard to understand how can, how can this, there be this transmigration? You know, we talk about it in Tantra as being something that happens when the indestructible drop opens. And that's all, that's all fine uh, if we have faith. If we have faith, and it turns out, as we discussed last time, that, that the intense observation of practice, quantum mechanically, allows you to determine, to some degree, your reality. And it could be, we talked about all kinds of variations of this, with uh, you know, the eigenstates that are, in, uh, that are the basis of, of one, uh, one uh, state of information going to only certain other states of information. But, but just simplifying it, if you, if, if you have a notion about this could be information transfer, then it allows you to think of what we now consider reincarnation, but without a self, not being the same self. And, and after all, what are you? Who are we? Right? We have this notion, we, our bodies are constantly changing. Every two years, I think all of our cells regenerate. So every two years, we're not physically the same. We have our memories, we have our consciousness, we have our information. Well, what if it turned out there's just a transfer of information, merely a transfer of information. This could still explain many things about, about reincarnation. So, so this is a way to actually, for someone like me, tend to be skeptical, to actually say, wait a minute. What they're saying, the Buddhists are saying about reincarnation without a soul, this could be 100% right. This could be right. This could make total sense. And if in fact this makes sense, possibly scientifically, because I might not buy Dharmakirti's argument, then it allows me to enter into a state where I have more faith in the entire body of teachings. If I have more faith, I do more practice. If I have more practice, I then put myself in a position, possibly, to do even more good because I can visualize the next being or the next, or on the way to Buddha, as you were talking about, Gary, on the way to Buddha in a more efficient way. So here, so here there may be ways to do it. You know, the other thing that always puzzled me, I mentioned before, is how do you get from this uh, body of, of energy and mind in practice you know, here you go, you've been, you've been following the Mahayana path. You vow to practice solely in order to benefit others, to achieve enlightenment, whatever that is, solely to become more powerful in being able to benefit others. And so you go ahead, you practice. You practice during your lifetime at creating a body of of energy and mind in the form of a Buddha. But then how then could you possibly right, become a real Buddha? So you're down there and all of a sudden you're, you're His Holiness the Dalai Lama or any of the wonderful teachers that exist. How, how, how is that possible? Is that, or is that just kind of some, again, leap of faith. I gotta believe in it because my, my Lama says it, which is a good reason. Good reason, again, because you see the character of your Lama and you say, wow, I want to be like that. And wow, this, this person, this woman knows so much and is such a great person. I want to be like that. Go. That's probably the best way to do it. That's, very, that, that's in a way, that's, that's kind of basic. That's Buddhism 101, Guru Yoga. Very important. But if you're a little disabled and you think about this stuff like I do, you know, it's always been, it's always been, guru yoga has always been tough for me. It's probably a real karmic deficit of mine. But, so it's helpful for me to think of it. So I'm thinking like, okay, how do you become a real Buddha? <sighs> Don't get it. Okay, body of wind and mind, great, okay. Body of wind and mind, I look like this, fine. Now, how do I become a real Buddha? Then I read about what's called the zero point. Zero point energy that in a, even in a vacuum, 
there is tremendous energy, which is actually can be recorded. And energy actually is emitted, is emanated from their energy fluctuations in an absolute vacuum. And it can be extremely powerful energies. Wow, there you go. That is not saying it's the way, because I certainly do not have enough knowledge to say it's the way. But there's an energy source to trans, E equals MC squared. It's, it's there, and so there could be a scientific way, how do you like this? To go from the Sambhogakaya, the enjoyment body made of, made of energy and mind, to the actual emanation body where you become Sarah, right? And you're out there in the world, you know, doing, doing good. Once again, so interesting that these scientific notions can support a faith in the whole system. So it's pretty cool to me that, that the more I think about it, whether or not, whether or not these are scientifically valid, at least they seem to support the whole system and not be inconsistent with it. So, so I had a conversation with with our teacher, John Spall, I asked him the same question. He's not a quantum physics person. Uh, but he's a wonderful teacher, amazing person. And uh, how would you create the Nirmanakaya, the actual body of a Buddha? And what he said was, by meditating on things as empty, you can create the physical emanation body from the mind, energy, um, illusory body in tantric practice. And some of you may know the story of how Chandrakirti milked a picture of a cow. You know that one? No, there, there's a, in, 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 in the debates, uh, you know, among Buddhists, various Buddhist schools of philosophy, Chandrakirti was the great Madhyamaka philosophy, uh, great Ma Madhyamaka philosopher wrote commentaries on the works of Nagarjuna. Very, very, very wonderful, his introduction to the Middle Way. Um, but anyway, it, it said that he was once in a debate with someone from another school, and just to prove he was, he was right, he, he just took the, he went up to a picture of a cow and milked it. <laughs> Got a glass of milk. And, and, so, but, and which always struck me as being, ah! You know, like, what? Like, what? 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 Superstition. And here, but here, Chomsball says, by meditating on emptiness, you can produce physical things. And here, I'm reading about the zero state, right? Quantum level zero state, full of energy. And it all, it all kind of makes sense. So thank you. Thank you, science. So, so when... So when we put all of these things together, could create, if we, if we use these things, could create a, a way of practice that, that allows us and our culture to have even more faith about it. And then as Matthew said, faith moves mountains. And we see how faith is so strong, even, even if you don't, create this, you know, Buddha body and, and walk around, you know, doing wonderful things. You know, I see it whenever, whenever you're in a hospital, you see that there are the people who really take care of people 24 hours a day, who usually are women, although men too, and they usually come from some part of Brooklyn that takes them about three hours by train to get to the hospital. They're usually supporting about, uh, you know, a lot of people, kids, etc., back often in the Caribbean, but sometimes other places. They're nobody's fools. They know exactly what's going on with the world, and they're people of deep, 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 deep faith. And so we already know how powerful faith is. So to see how modern physics can help us enter into faith, 
and that faith itself and its transformative qualities are completely consistent with the notion of intense observation in quantum mechanics, really kind of starts bringing things together. And maybe what we're seeing is the objective, objective science and the subjective investigation of meditators and philosophers um, starting to come together. And at the same time, we have artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence, moving forward. We're really at quite a time that we've been born into. Now, especially those of you who are younger. It's a really exciting time. It is the time. So, so that's, pretty much, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. So now we're at the end of these three talks. And, uh, and this is... And where have we ended up? Uh, we, I think where I end up with all this and it's so wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. And, it's so, and, and to all of you who are out there too, thank you so much. Um, preparing for these, I wish it to all of you because the secret about teaching, of course, is it's the greatest way to learn because you're scared to death that you're going to come, you actually have to stand in front of all of you and you know, say something that might help, might be valuable. Anyway, so... So, my conclusion from all this is it's a totally amazing world. Um, and, and we should keep that sense of wonder and amazement always in our hearts because that makes life extraordinary. And actually, that's the original meaning of stupid, which comes from the same root as stupendous and stupefied. I'll take that kind of stupid. Um, the stupid of maybes. The other thing is, we, we, we can't leave it to the experts. We all have to be involved in whatever it is, sharing our expertise. There are all kinds of really interesting partnerships happening. The one that is really interesting to me is how uh, there's an anesthesiologist, Stuart Hameroff, and he's out there doing his work in anesthesiology and research, and he reads a book by Roger Penrose, the physicist, and he writes to Penrose and he says, wait a minute, you're talking about, you're, you're talking about you know, your theories of physics and quantum mechanics, and Penrose is one of the great ones, and says, wow, I think this, the quantum processes could be happening in the microtubules in the neurons, and they could be functioning as some kind of quantum computer. This means that instead of um, there being 10 to the 16th connections that have to be uploaded uh, into a computer for us to achieve uh, immortality. That way, it becomes 10 to the 26th power. It's much more complicated. That's 10 billion times more complicated, which means it may take them a little bit longer to do that. But anyway, so those, those guys get together and they come up with all these great, amazing theories. So we all have to put our expertises together. Um, um, it, really, it really helps. It's a form of sharing. The other thing is, uh, don't, don't be afraid to get lost. Right? We spent our first two talks on that. Getting lost is good. That's the only way you can get found. Let yourself be lost. Be joyful in it. Don't be afraid of it. You know, but then bring yourself back. Uh, the other thing is, for all of us who are so attached to these things, take a few minutes every day and just think about nothing exists. If it's easier to think about well, is existence better than non-existence? And enter into it that way, a little bit easier to think about non-existence. That's good medicine for us who think that everything exists. So, so I'll do that sometimes. And I'll think, wow, isn't it wonderful? We're all here. No, we're not. No, we're not. And, 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 it's, and it's medicine. It's great medicine. See, the other way to think about it too is that we're never in the present. Like my impressions right now, this isn't the present. It's taking a little bit of time for all of us to process this. So never even in the present. Right, and like we talked about last time, how time, there is no present time, that, that the present here is two million years in the Andromeda galaxies, and, and there, there really is no, nothing like time. So anyway, and the last thing is, um, stick with compassion and love, and you can't go wrong. Because this opens our hearts. This is the, the quick way to seeing 
everyone else and everything else, a quick way to seeing reality. You don't have to be a philosopher, you don't have to be a quantum physicist. You just have to kind of open your eyes and see and love and feel, and that immediately gets you into a keener sense of reality. Um, so then, one of the first thing that John Small and I translated was the, uh, it was right after he taught me the, the alphabet, the Tibetan alphabet, it was the, the hundred sayings of, of Padampa Sangya to the Dingri people. And the last thing he says, and I'm, believe me, I'm not, I'm not equating myself with Padampa Sangya, but he said at the very end, at the very end, he says, Buddha is right next to you, people. Buddha is right next to you, and Buddha is right next to you, next to us, right? I'm leaving. Cut off your misconceptions right now. All right, thanks. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit tibethouse.us. Thanks for watching. Tashi Delek.